all of the Stoic doctrines, all the Stoic dogmas come from the idea that human reason has to have a source, that it's not an accident, that it didn't happen by chance. Friends, and welcome back to the Strong Stoic Podcast. I'm your host, Brandon Tumblin. You know, and today I have the privilege of talking with Chris Fisher. Chris is the owner of the website traditionalstoicism.com. He's also the host of the podcast Stoicism on Fire. Uh, I connected with Chris, and he has a really great understanding of traditional stoicism, meaning the stoicism that was original, okay, back in the Greeks, the way the Greeks practiced stoicism, and uh, the Greeks and the Romans. And so, Chris, his main goal is to sort of bring back these traditional values of Stoicism, the spirituality aspects, the fate, the providence, the God aspects of Stoicism. So I had a wonderful time talking with him. Please welcome Chris Fisher. Hello, Chris. Welcome to the podcast, man. Thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you for having me, Brandon. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, really, really excited to talk with you. You know, we connected before and I'm a huge fan of your, your podcast, Stoicism on Fire. And... It's very rare that I hear someone talk with such depth of knowledge when it comes to, uh, you know, as, as you name it, traditional stoicism. And so I, I want to start just by getting an idea of why you think the traditional stoicism is so important and how does it sort of differ in your mind? Like how, are you, how do you con- contrast sort of traditional stoicism with what you might call, I don't know, modern stoicism of today? What are sort of the, the big picture items that you, that you think about? Yeah, well, I think there's one fundamental difference and and that is that um, traditional stoicism uh, is an attempt to bring forth the foundational doctrines of the stoa and try to make sense of them in modern times but to hold on to them and by them i mean the basic fundamental doctrines which are uh, you know in in logic the concept of a, a cognitive impression in physics, the concept of a providentially ordered cosmos, and in ethics, the idea that virtue is the only good, not just the highest good, but the only good. I think that um, modern Stoics would agree with traditional Stoics on two of those. The one that we disagree on is the concept of a providentially ordered cosmos. Uh, their, their take is essentially to uh, abandon that and try to bring in a, a modern, uh, you know, I say modern with quotation marks, mm-hmm. um, scientific worldview to replace the Stoic worldview. So that's that's really the thing that separates traditional Stoicism from modern Stoicism. The implications of that, of course, are are many, as they were in ancient times, because that worldview is what separated the ancient Stoics from the ancient Epicureans. The ancient Epicureans, of course, were you know, the, the Adams side of that Providence or Adams dichotomy. And they believed that the universe was uh, largely random and uh, chance. And the Stoics said, no, it is, it is providentially ordered. And so we see the implications of that in uh, their, their ethics. And we see in modern times, as much as they may try to fight it, they, we, we, we start to see this bleed into some rather odd uh, formulations that are a result of abandoning the physics. You know, once you give a, once you give up the foundation, then basically anything can become be made of stoicism, and that is what is happening to some degree within the modern stoic movement. You have, you know, uh, people all over the map in terms of their beliefs, and uh, you didn't have you had varying degrees. You had well, you say you had differences in the ancient stoa, but the scholars will tell you you didn't have any differences on those fundamental doctrines. They all agreed on those. That's what it meant to be a Stoic. Mm-hmm. One of the things that you, you say, I think, in every episode is you say that, you know, traditional Stoicism brings back sort of the spiritual aspect of Stoicism. And I, I, I love that. And it, that, that's sort of a key word that you hear pretty often today. You know, people talk about spiritual practices a lot of times in the form of like meditation and, and yoga or even, you know, that, that sort of thing. But I personally think that it's really hard to live a happy life as a human being without any sort of spiritual aspect whatsoever so i 
I love the fact that you use that term and sort of bring it back. And like, what does that what does that really mean to you in terms of of, of stoicism, uh, particularly traditional stoicism, like that idea of spirituality? What what specifically is that? Well, it, it's tied into the concept of a providential cosmos. So if if the the uh, cosmos is truly providentially ordered, then there's some kind of an intelligence. We would say, you know, I, I'll just say behind it, but it's not really behind it. It's within it. It's it's imminent within it. But it means that there's a purpose to all of this. The the cosmos has some purpose. Now that purpose may not be uh, specifically to benefit Chris Fisher. You know, it, it, in fact, I would mm -hmm. argue it's not specifically to benefit Chris Fisher or you know Brandon. It is to benefit itself as a whole. We benefit from that. But the idea that I'm a part of an organism, which is what the Stoics conceived the cosmos to be. I'm a part of this organism that has a, a telos, that has a purpose, that has a design, and that I'm playing a role in that, and that part of my role is to align my being, you know, all of, all of my uh, desires, all of my ascents, all of my uh, actions with that goal is a spiritual practice in and of itself. So you're saying, I am no longer the the summum bonum of existence, which is kind of where you go with a lot of you know, nihilism and, and some of the other concepts that abandon any spirituality at, at all. What are you left with? Well, the only thing that's good is what I define as good, right? And then we can mm -hmm. have a fight over what we define as good. But when we, can, when we can point to some kind of good outside of ourselves, which is the purpose of the cosmos, and then tie ourselves into that and live a life according to it, which is, again, what um, the Stoics argue is that, you know, the, the good life is the life lived in agreement or in accord with nature. Nature being not trees and rocks and rivers and lakes, but nature meaning the entire cosmos, all of existence. When we're in harmony with that, then and only then can we uh, actually live a virtuous life and experience well-being or eudaimonia is the word that the Greeks used. Mm -hmm. it, it's such a it's such a way to sort of ease a lot of the anxiety and discomfort we have in day to day life when you adopt that mentality, right? Like particularly like because most people have a job of some sort, right? And they they work with people. Some of those people they're going to like. Some of those people they're not going to like. And, and Marcus Aurelius is one of his most famous things. It probably gets talked about way too much. But you know he's talking about how in his life he's going to meet these people. He's going to meet good people, he's going to meet some people that are going to annoy him. And so he's preparing himself to sort of be kind. But that really gets down to that idea of, of, of providence, like how you fit in with everything around you. And, and that it's not, it's like you mentioned, it's not about you per se. And you, you put it really beautifully one, I think the last time we spoke, you said sometimes things might not be good for you, but that doesn't mean that they're not good for the cosmos. <laughs> and that, right. And that's that's uh, really well put, but it's interesting because like, okay, so let's take that example. This will be interesting to talk about. So let's say you're in a situation where that is that is the case. So some, something bad is happening to you right now individually. And so you adopt this idea of the providence and you say, well, this is good for the whole. But it, like, like how, how do you implement that in that particular moment when you're sort of feeling that? Is it is it, I don't know, do you personally find that easy or do you think there's like a... a What's, what's the cognitive practice to, to, I guess, achieve that? Well, I would say easy, no, and, and do I fail at it frequently? Yes. But the <laughs> idea is that when I'm, in a, when I'm experiencing an event that I am at that moment perceiving to be you know, bad, the first thing I have to do is say, okay, realize this is not really truly bad because it's not affecting my character. But let's, let's take it outside of bad and go to you know, preferred indifferent as opposed to a dispreferred indifferent. Well, that's... It is, it is in the handling of the indifference that we develop our virtue. We don't develop our virtue by dealing exclusively with things that are good and bad, but really how we handle the indifference. So let's say um, I'm on my way to work and there's an aggressive driver that cuts me off and forces me to slam on my brakes. Well, at that point, you know, I could say, well, this is something bad for me and I could let anger start to rise up in me and I might honk my horn and you know, in, in my case, since I'm a law enforcement officer, I might turn on my lights and siren if the, you know, but mm -hmm. that's not the point. The point is I can stop and I can say, okay, even though this, this moment, and, and we can use anyone, it could be, uh, or anything, it could be the loss of a leg, the loss of a loved one, the loss of a child. This thing that I'm experiencing as a dispreferred indifferent, the question I have to stop and ask and is what 
could the cosmic purpose be here? What good can come out of this? And the only good that I'm in control of is the good that I can develop in my own character as a result of this particular event. So I can be angry about it. I can you know, moan and groan about it. None of that helps me to develop my character. But if I look at this thing and I say, okay, you know, now I, I, I only have one leg. I don't have two legs any longer. And it's not gonna do me any good to moan and groan about it, but what can I do uh, to develop my character as a result of, of this apparent tragedy or the loss of a loved one? And I think all of us, I know, well, I'll speak for myself. I know that long before I became a stoic, you know, I, I found myself, you know, um, resonating with stories of people who overcame tragedy. I think there's a, just an innate part of our nature that it's like, we, we, we love to see people who overcome, who, you know, in spite mm -hmm. of it all, they, they somehow, uh, prosper and, and by prosper, I mean, live a good life. And that doesn't mean they get wealthy. That doesn't mean that life is easy for them, but they, they internalize, you, you see uh, veterans that come back and have had their legs blown off. And some of them are destroyed by that. And others take that as an opportunity to do something positive. It might be helping other veterans. It might be helping you know kids that were born without legs, but they take what has happened to them and they turn it into something good rather than just sitting down in the corner and crying about it and complaining about it, that, the, that life has not been fair to me. You know, Mark, one of the uh, Marcus's famous statements is, you know, that um, basically I'm paraphrasing, but if you're, if you're upset about the way thing or what life has handed you, then stop and think about it. It's either Providence or Adams. You can be angry because it's just chance, or you can try to find some purpose in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that about Marx realize he does that a lot with things. He, um, he did this with God as well. You know, he sort of broke down the both sides of the spectrum. Well, if there's a God, uh, if there is a God, you should be good because God wants you to be good. But if there's not a God, you should still be good because <clears throat> now you can be good on earth, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Um, so one of the things I thought about when you're t mentioning that car story, so let's say you, you're you in that situation and you make, let's say, the, the wrong, you do the wrong impulse. Let's say you get angry and, uh, you know, you call the guy an idiot, flip him off. And one of the things that I've been actually me and Josh from uh, in search of wisdom, we've been trying to sort of get to the bottom of this, where the balance is between forgiving yourself yet, yet reflecting on the things that you've done in the past and growing from it. Right. Cause it's not like you can just forgive everything you do. I mean, you do forgive, you know, in, in some way over time, but it's not like you never feel bad about anything bad you do. You have, there has to be some reflection on it at the same time. You can't, uh, you can't, like if, if you flip someone off in traffic yesterday, you can't spend the next five years beating yourself up about it. So like there, there's, there's some level of, I guess, what would you say? Like suffering. And I, I know that's a Christian term, but there's some sense of that that's sort of required for you to, to grow and become a better person from those situations. I don't know. Would, would you agree with that or disagree? Or what, what, do you, what do you think that balances between self forgiving, but, but deep reflection on your own flaws? Yeah, I, I I haven't come across anything in the in Stoic text that talks about forgiving yourself, um, mm -hmm. like in that sense, or certainly beating yourself up. There's uh, obviously there should be a point of reflection. That's that's prosake. That's paying attention, right? So if I'm paying attention to my behaviors and I recognize that one of my behaviors was inappropriate, then the due course of action is for me first of all, you know, to stop the behavior. So if I'm I'm angry at the driver, you know, it's never too late to say stop just just stop and and take a deep breath count to 10 and think think about what what you're doing and 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 then you have that moment to reflect and say all right um what do i do next one of the passages i love about epictetus or from epictetus discourses is the idea that when you get knocked down what does he say does he say well sit there and think about it and pout about it for a while no he says you get knocked down get back up it's as simple as that so the reflection is, I made a bad mistake. I'm going to get back up and I'm not going to do that thing, that thing again, you know, beating mm -hmm. myself up over it. But that doesn't mean, you know, the, the flip side, oh, well, it's no big deal because the truth is, is you just did some damage to your character. You know, mm -hmm. uh, the truth is, is that each one of our, uh, our acts that are inappropriate are just as damaging as any other. The, there was no moral equivalency in, in stoicism. Uh, there, you know, if I, if I honk at a, 
a person or you know, fire a gun at them in terms of the damage that it did to me, not to them, but the damage that it does to me and to my character is the same. So mm -hmm. realize that you've just done some damage to your character, get back up, behave appropriately the next time. Mm -hmm. And this time, but the first thing you've got to do is, is, is recognize, you know, I, I talk about a, a series of steps, stop it, strip it bare and see it from a cosmic perspective. And this is dealing with impressions. So the first, but it's never too late to say, stop it. And the problem is, is that the farther you get down an, an emotional path, especially if it happens to be anger, it's very hard to say, stop it. But at some point you have to say, okay, I've got to stop this. I have to strip this emotion that I'm having bare, which means take a look at it. Where is this coming from? Why am I angry? What, how am I, how am I uh, misjudging this impression? Because obviously someplace, someplace along the line, I've assumed that I've experienced some harm, right? Or I wouldn't really be angry and, and reacting. So where was that, that I made that false judgment that I somehow was, was harmed by this guy cutting me off in traffic? Because I wasn't harmed. I mean, even if he cut me off so bad that I got in a crash, you know, my, my moral character isn't harmed. I might be harmed physically, but he didn't harm my moral character unless I allow that to harm my moral character because I'm the only one who can harm my moral character. The angry driver, the, you know, the angry boss, the whatever they can't, they can't harm my character. Only I can do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, that's a, uh, that's sort of how I've been trained to think as well. Uh, obviously in, in stoicism, it's all about the character, but do you think part of that, part of that is also detaching yourself from the good things people say or do so slightly different example. So let's say you have a boss at work, you know, you mentioned, <clears throat> excuse me, your boss can't negatively affect your character and, and rightly so. Um, however, uh, you know, they might do something that, uh, I don't know, let me think they might do something that sort of makes you, um, they, they, they could have either effect on you. They could have a positive effect or, or a negative effect on your character. Right. Um, I'm sorry. I just completely lost my train of thought. <laughs> I, I can't even remember where I was going with that. Um, well, it sounded like where you were going is that, you know, you could, they could do something which you could perceive to be a good for you as opposed yes. to perceived to be a bad. Yes. And, and really it's the same thing because any good that a boss can do for you is going to be an external good, right? He can't, he can't change your moral character. Now it might be true that a boss could, or a company could create a, a work environment that is more conducive as an example to someone uh, being able to develop their moral character and meaning they're, they're, it's not a hostile workforce. You're not coming to work and people antagonizing you all of the time, but mm -hmm. still ultimately, no matter what's happening in that workplace, it's um, you are the one, you are the person who is uh, impacting your moral character for the good or for the bad. Your boss can't do that. Same way that, you know, your spouse can't do that. You're, mm -hmm. you're, you know, having, having raised a number of children of my own, one of the hardest things to accept is that, you know, they're an individual and no matter what I try to do, they're going to do their own thing. Ultimately, they may take my advice. They may not, but the decisions that they make are not harming me. They're harming them if it's a bad decision. And if they make a good decision, you know, as a father, I may want to take credit for it, but it's really not for me to take credit. They're the ones who made that decision to do something good. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, but I suppose it gets down to as well, like <clears throat> a lot of people base how they feel about themselves on other people's opinions. Right. So what, right. what you see some days and you see this a lot today is people, they, they have this circle of friends that sort of tell them they're all great and they're, you know, they're good people and they're perfect. Um, but I feel like to detach, if you want to detach yourself from sort of the negative aspects of what people say about you. So if people are trying to bring you down and, and give you a lot of, let's say, unnecessary criticisms, I feel like you can't detach yourself from that unless you also detach yourself from the good things that people are saying about you. Right. So, because I feel what mm -hmm. people do is they, they try and surround themselves with people that are telling them, oh, you're so good, you're perfect and everything. And then they say, anyone that says anything against me, they're, they're just stupid and they're idiotic, but then they still get bothered by that. I see that a lot. People still get bothered by those things. You know, someone says something online that they never even met something bad about them. So I feel like, and, and this is where I was trying to tie in with the boss thing. If your boss gives you sort of positive feedback and let's say they're the type of boss that's always telling you you're doing a good job, 
you know, like for me, I look at it and I say, well, I'm doing the best I can anyway. So whether or not, you know, obviously there's something to be said about feedback and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But for me, at the end of the day, if I'm trying my best and I am and I am doing as good as I potentially can, it shouldn't really matter to me too much whether or not my boss will sort of, you know, bribe me up or run me down or whatever. Uh, assuming, of course, all this is with the presupposition that I am trying my best at work and, you know, doing the best I can and improving and, and, and so on. Um, so do you think there is that detachment then between what what the good things people say about you, but also the bad things they say about you? Or do you think you, <laughs> obviously you should detach yourself from both, but do you think if you only focus on the one, uh, you, you can't detach yourself from the other? Does, does that make sense? Yeah, well, it's, it's also, yes, absolutely. And it's also a part of, we always focus on, we tend to focus, especially in the West, on the bad things that happen to us and that we have to worry about the bad things that happen to us. Sometimes, sometimes for a lot of people, and this is even proven uh, by sociologists, the worst tragedy that could happen to you is winning the lottery, as ironic as that might be. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. Okay, so, you know, the, the, um, the promotion to the next job, which is, hey, great job, here, I'm gonna promote you, might be the worst thing that ever happened to you. So as far as, yes, you absolutely have to separate yourself from all opinion, good and bad, because really the opinions of others have no value to you. The opinions of others, uh, it, it, because the only value to you is, is did I act appropriately? Were, were my actions appropriate as measured by the, the virtues? Not mm -hmm. whether someone thinks that they're appropriate uh, for me, because let's face it, in, in corporate America, and I've worked in, I've been in, in the US military, I've spent 20 years in corporate America, and I've been in law enforcement for 15 years. It's no different anywhere, meaning yeah. you are to a large degree in just about any job you take, you will be motivated uh, by your superiors in, in many cases to do things that are questionable ethically in order to get ahead, to get a promotion, right? Mm -hmm. So just because, in fact, you, you should almost use it as a warning sign when someone applauds you and, hey, great job. You need to ask, why do they think I'm doing a great job? And if it's because I'm doing something that's, you know, inappropriate, well, then, you know, that's that's not uh, mm -hmm. an opinion that I should be seeking. But yeah, you are correct in the sense that if you're going to ignore the negative opinions of others, you also have to ignore the positive opinions of others. They go hand in hand. Now, when I say ignore it, yeah. that doesn't mean you should truly ignore it. It just means right. you need to understand what what those opinions are they are just their opinions and and they need to be measured against uh against the virtues not against this individual's opinion yeah yeah no one would say if your boss is giving you constructive criticism you should ignore it right you but no, you need to no. be you need to be detached from it right i uh i had this interesting case in a previous job where a particular manager just did not like me for whatever reason his own particular reason and then I don't know, several months into the job, he got to know me a bit better and he, he actually started liking me. And I remember like a coworker of mine came over and was like, Hey, he's starting to like you. This is good. And I remember just thinking like, no, it's not it's like, it doesn't, I haven't changed anything. <laughs> like, how is this good or bad? And he couldn't, my coworker, my friend, he couldn't understand how I didn't, I honestly did not care whether or not the manager liked me now or less because I was still doing the same thing. And that's sort of the power in this. And, you know, you might look at that and say, well, you're just denying yourself feeling good because, you know, now the manager likes you. But another manager could come in and hate me, you know, or I would have not been happy previously. So I think there's there's really something to be said about about that. And people deal with that every day in their day in their jobs. So um, it's cool. Uh one of the things I wanted to pick your brain about, because I feel like some people get hung up on this idea with with stoicism, is this sort of balance between fate and free will. Because, you know, obviously you hear this idea of fate and providence. And I think the thing that people get hung up on is they, they see stoicism. And obviously stoicism is all about behavioral changes. It's all about changing what you can do and, and your own actions. And I think there's this, this uh, confusion on how any form of free will can be included in the grand idea of fate and providence. And so like, how do you, how do you reconcile those two 
seemingly opposing views between fate and free will, which is, to be fair, a huge debate even today. People are <laughs> academics are still debating this, right? Like, how, how does that mm -hmm. reconciled in Stoicism? Well, I'll, I'll tell you when you know when I went through the Marcus Aurelius uh, school at the at the College of Stoic Philosophers, this was the, the the part that is the hardest to grasp. And and you know I would be kidding you if I said yeah I've got it all figured out, but there are some things that help me to I guess accept to uh, what appear to be contradictory ideas. The the Stoics said you know first of all the world is uh, teleological and it is determined, and then at the same time. They said, we are morally responsible. Now, when we try to pattern that out logically, we'll say, we say, well, if my behavior is determined, then how can I be responsible for it, right? right. And there's, there's an apparent conflict there. So when you step back from that, and then you, again, let's, let's bring in stoic physics into this. Let's bring in the concept that, uh, that the, the entire cosmos is an organism and that the entire cosmos is uh, everything in it, everything that exists is a combination of uh, logos and matter or pneuma and matter, but pneuma is you know, uh, spirit, but everything is a, a piece of, it's all God and everything has a piece of God and a piece of what we would call matter combined in it for it to be a body and allow it to act or be acted upon. So if, if everything in the universe or the cosmos is comprised of the same things and we're all interconnected. And then there's another concept that the Stoics uh, talked about, and that is cofate. Over and over again, we see uh, both Epictetus and Seneca say, talk about the God within. Well, what is the God within for Stoics? It's not, it's not a supernatural soul, but it, what it is, is it's a configuration of the pneuma in each of us, which is that portion of the divine that exists when he, within each of us. So. I'm an agent. I, I, as a human being, am an agent operating in the cosmos. The cosmos is an agent. And so anything that happens in my life is co-fated. I am operating with the cosmos in order to make things happen. And the freedom that we do have is the freedom to make choices. And uh, we can argue about exactly what that means, but it, it's the, 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 uh, Epictetus is talking about the the uh, the proresis, the rational faculty, and says that even Zeus can't override that. That's a power that we have, and of course he's using Zeus as a combination, you know, a, a, a term for for God as a whole. But nature, God, can't override our freedom of choice. So in some way, we do have, and, and I think we make the mistake of calling it free will, because there mm. really is no free will. I mean, there, I, I don't get to just choose whatever I want. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm five foot nine. I couldn't choose to be an, a, an NBA basketball player, no matter how much I tried, you know, and, and, and I can't jump. So, and, and I'm also not going to be a lineman on an NFL football team. <laughs> so th that is not a choice that I have. There are some choices that I am limited in the choices that I can make throughout my life. And in every instance, I'm limited by the choices that I can make. Now, what is also true is that each of us has a, our, uh, Chrysippus has talked about the, uh, our character being either a, uh, a cylinder or uh, a top. So in other words, if you roll a cylinder down a particular hill, it's going to roll the way it's going to roll based upon its shape. If you spin a top, that top is going to spin based upon its shape. Well, that shape is a metaphor for the character, our moral character. Mm -hmm. So what, what is, what is he saying here? Uh, Christ is saying that if you push two different cylinders down the exact same hill and their shape is different, they're going to roll differently, right? Mm -hmm. That's us. So my character, when I face a particular impression in a particular set of circumstances, I'm going to respond to that in a given way based upon the way my character existed at that moment in time. That's how I'm going to react to that because that was who I was. Now, where there's, I, I believe that there are two things that can be done here is that one, we've already talked about. After my cylinder, my character rolled down that hill, I could stop and say, you know, man, that was a bumpy ride. I, I think I need to smooth some edges off here. 
so that the next time that same impression gives me that little push because that's what the impression does. It's a force you know, that acts upon us from the outside. I'm going to roll in a more appropriate way. Mm-hmm. So uh, I, I, I have some control, but um, can I choose not to be pushed? No, the, the push mm-hmm. is there. The push is an external force. But I, right. but my, and my character is going to determine uh, how I respond to that push. When we say free will, we could almost imply, well, I want the push to take me left or right, or I want it to go over the backside of the hill. We don't have that amount of freedom. And some, mm-hmm. I think, can reasonably argue, even from a stoic perspective, that at that particular time, you don't even have the freedom to choose. You're just, you're just going to react. But I don't agree with that. I, I think that the difference between, um, even in stoicism, but we see it in, in, uh, in uh, modern science in terms of the difference between animals and humans, is that we do have the ability to say, even after we receive that initial impulse, because you to react a certain way. Example, someone comes up to me and slaps me across the face. It's arguably a human reaction to turn around and slap him back, right? Hmm. Something has trained me to not do that. Now, if you if you take two uh, two year olds and you put them together and one hits one of them, the other one is either going to hit them back or they're going to cry. But right. oftentimes they might hit back. And they have to be told and trained, don't hit. That's not that's not an appropriate act. Well, in time, they grow into adults, and hopefully, when someone you know says something mean to them or someone pushes them, they don't turn around and do something completely inappropriate. You know, I will tell you, you know, in 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 my profession in law enforcement, you know, I can't tell you how many times. Well, why did you shoot the guy? Well, he disrespected me. Now we look at that and we say that's insane, mm-hmm. but the. The, the, in their character in uh, the way the way that they have developed as a human being it makes perfect sense that if someone disrespects me i'm going to shoot them or stab them or you know maybe just knock their teeth out but that that is a learned behavior right so right. we we have the opportunity and and I, and I think free will comes down to just that it's realizing that i am a co-creator Anything that happens is not something, life is not happening to me. Impressions are happening to me and life is happening within because I get to make those choices from within. But I, you know, and I, and I wish I could tell you, yeah, this is the simple formula for understanding stoic determinism, but it doesn't exist. You know, you, yeah. you, really, you really have to learn to, to, to live in it. And sometimes it makes sense to you and sometimes it doesn't. It is, it is really complicated. I, I have an analogy that I, I, developed years ago just in my I was journaling one day and I came up with this I'll be interested to know what you think about it so but thinking about this and it's interesting you mentioned about how we each have our own uh, sort of individual strengths and weaknesses right you mentioned basketball might not be yours mm-hmm. and so th- it's interesting because you know you talk about we talk about equality of opportunity and that's a worthy goal but it sort of came to me I guess sometime last year when I was really thinking about it that it's a worthy goal but th- we still can't really attain that because we each do have individual strengths and individual weaknesses. Okay. Because I don't have the same opportunity as someone who is much taller than me for basketball, for a particular thing. Um, and in fact, I guess sort of the realization I came to was that, you know, that's whatever is different about you, whatever is unique about you, whatever is unequal about you, like that's what you have to offer to the world. That's Mm -hmm. particularly what you have to offer to the world. And so it's, again, I think we should move towards equality of opportunity as a society, but at the same time, it's impossible for one, unless we're all copy paste of each other, which would create a boring world. And two, what are you going to offer to the world if it's not some part of your inequality, if it's not something that is different about you? And arguably that's what you're doing when you go get a degree or when you learn or when you develop your character, like you're, you're trying to, to put us, put your own spark on things. I know I got a little off topic. I was ta- I wanted to bring up this analogy. So I imagine a boat. Now I'm, I come from a fishing family, so maybe that's where this came from. But I imagine a boat, a sailboat, basic. You have a rudder, you have a sail. Okay, mm-hmm. so that's pretty much what you have available to you in terms of navigation. Now, what you don't have, and I sort of feel like this is, is something like fate. What you can't control is is the wind, and you can't control the waves either. What's interesting about sailing is that you can actually go in any direction you want. 
and a lot, a lot of people that haven't sailed, they don't understand this, but it's, it's a really simple concept. If you go, you can, the best way you can possibly go sailing is, is with the wind. Wind at your sails, that's where the phrase came from, mm -hmm. wind at your sails, right? Go straight. Mm -hmm. um, but you can go sideways as well, and you can actually go directly against the wind if you mm -hmm. zigzag, mm -hmm. right? So Tacking. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So what's interesting, unless you do what, what we do, is we just uh, we sail one way and then we row back the other way in our little <laughs> rowboat. But, but, if, but if you think about that, that's really interesting to me because I feel like in many ways, as you mentioned, I sort of feel like going with the wind, that's sort of developing your character in that positive way. And you can go the opposite way if you want. Or, or, or you know, you can go against the wind. You can make it as rough as you possibly would like in, in life in general, right? But the question is, like, what's going to be, in your words, the best way to sail more appropriately given the weather conditions, right? Mm. Does that – what do you think of that analogy? Yeah, I, I like the analogy if you're careful with it. And by that I mm. mean um, I think you have to avoid putting into the analogy that I should uh, buy – I should be going with the wind or against the wind. That's the only part of that I'm a little bit nervous about because there are mm. there are some people that take stoicism and you know the concept that the you know the obstacle is the way that that means right. that stoicism is all about looking for obstacles and overcoming obstacles. That's not what stoicism is about. So sometimes the winds are going to be in favor and sometimes they're not. That's you know I have a I have a, a blog post uh, titled "The Winds of Fortuna" and Seneca talks a lot about this. And so the, the idea is if you're sailing, you have a goal in mind, right? You have a destination that you're trying to reach. And sometimes when you're trying to reach that destination, the wind might be at your back. You might uh, wind in your sails. And the next day, the wind may be trying to blow you into the rocks. And the wind might be trying to blow you off course. The wind might be coming directly at you. But the point is mm -hmm. the destination, the goal, which in our case is virtue, right? Arete, mm -hmm. excellence of character. As long as as long as our boat is consistently aimed at that goal, then fortuna is just the things that that happen that are are maybe challenges and sometimes they may not. Like I said, some days I may have the wind at my back and some days it may be at, you know in my but but my goal has to remain the same. I'm, right. I'm have, I have a direction. I'm heading toward the uh, the goal of uh, of arete of, of virtue. Yeah. But see, yeah, we well tend to want sure. we tend to want uh, the wind at our back all the time, which kind of ties mm -hmm. into the idea of you know equality. In fact, my next episode of Stoicism on Fire, I'm dealing with in Chiridian Centine, where Epictetus talks about uh, he uses the the metaphor of life as a play, and that each of us are assigned a role, and the, we don't we don't get to pick the role. You know, we're assigned mm -hmm. a role. And in the uh, by God, you know, by the cosmos. So, well, how are we assigned a role? Well, you're assigned a role by again. I was born a five foot nine guy that can't jump. Okay, so that's that's part of my role. That's not my whole role. But that that biological fact about me limits what I can do in life. But at the same mm -hmm. time, I have other things that that maybe open doors for me. So once again. If a tragedy occurs in your life, what is a, an apparent tragedy? The question is, is this, is this a door opening for me? And that's where, mm -hmm. the, the, again, we tie back into the, the concept of providence and, and Seneca's idea of fortuna. The wind can't harm me. Even if it blows my, my uh, boat onto the, onto the rocks, it's not harming me. It may be destroying my boat and I may have to build another boat, but I still have the same goal in mind. And I can still be a person of solid character while I'm rebuilding my boat and setting back out for the the course that I originally intended to to aim at. Right. Mm -hmm. so yeah. All, so, all yeah. Are... Yeah. No, that's that's a great point. Um, the, the way I I think I thought about it in a little bit in the past was sort of like you talked about how we each have our own sort of individual strengths and weaknesses, and so. You know, Sorry, like okay, and I don't want to interrupt you, but I wanted to point out something before you want yeah. because I thought of it earlier. There yeah. are actually three different natures in Stoicism. There's nature as a whole. There's human nature as a whole, 
and then there's your individual nature. And I think sometimes right. we forget that third piece, which is, and that's what we're talking about now, your right. role, who you are, that is your individual nature. And we are not all the same. We're not all created the same. Yeah. And that's, yeah. And that's, that's really well put. And that's exactly how I think about this boat analogy, because, you know, again, for me, one of the ways to, for me to be aligned personally with my character, I think is pretty much what I'm doing now. You know, I'm, I'm obviously, I'm really into philosophy. I have the podcast going on. I have, uh, I have, uh, strength sports and strength coaching and a bit of engineering and that stuff. That's very well aligned with my personal nature. However, it's not that I couldn't pursue basketball as a career. I'm you're five nine. I'm five seven. It's not that I couldn't pursue basketball mm -hmm. as a career. I could, but I'd be going against the wind in many ways, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. So and do you think though? Here's here's something worth considering. Do you think that it's some sort of obligation for you to do that in what would you say in service to the world? To, to harness your individual strengths? Or do you think it should be, there should be maybe a balance in between that and the subjective enjoyment in it? This, this can get very tangly really quick, but I'm really interested to know what you say. Is the question, sorry, is the question clear? I, I think so. Um, I'll, I'll try to answer it and then you can tell me if, I, if it's clear or not. <laughs> Yes, uh, absolutely, you have an obligation, that is a duty, to to pursue what it is that you can contribute to the cosmopolis as a whole. That's part mm -hmm. of Stoicism. So what role do I play in the cosmopolis? And in, for some of us, that might mean going into politics. For some of us, it might mean running a business. For some of us, it might be just being a parent. Um, it, you know, so... You have to find your role, and and I think it's inappropriate for others to judge what your role may be. I mean, one of, I think one of the unfortunate side effects of modern society is we've become so homogenous. You know, everybody, there's this concept yeah. of everybody has to be a certain way. You know, you have to go to college, and you have to get a degree, and you have to, you know, get a job at this stage, and by this age, you should be doing this, and you have to get married, and you have to have children, and, and some of... That's not necessarily true for every single person. Yeah, it, it wasn't true for Epictetus, obviously. It wasn't true. Right. You know, Marcus Aurelius is a good example. Marcus didn't want to be an emperor. It's clear. Mm -hmm. he, his, his, he wanted to be a philosopher. That's really what he, where his heart was. He wanted to be a philosopher. But he realized, based upon the circumstances that had occurred in his life, that the cosmos was calling him to be an emperor. And so his role was to be the best emperor that he could be not to be the best philosopher he could be, but he didn't have to abandon, abandon philosophy to be an emperor. And in fact, you know, arguably he was a better emperor because he was a philosopher. Yeah. So I, I don't know that, um, I, now the other part of that is, should I ignore that to seek some kind of pleasure? Well, that that's very Epicurean. You know, if I'm going to um, ignore my role ignore my duty and seek what uh, feels good or not even necessarily feels good, but just what um, I would say, what allows me to find a state of, um, of ataraxia, of, you know, no tension, no, no distress. Yeah. That's very Epicurean. And again, a lot of people try to do that, try to remove the stress from their life rather than saying, well, I need to learn how to overcome the stress, how to deal with that that stress. And that does, again, doesn't, doesn't mean that we invite these things into our lives, but you're not going to be a human being living in the world and, and not uh, experience stressors. That's just a part of, yeah. of human life. Yeah. I've always found that, you know, it's so interesting when you talk about that idea of people wanting to remove challenge and adversity in their life. And it, you know, when you hear that, it sort of makes sense and understandable, but I've, I've always thought about it somewhat like, if you go into the gym, so, okay, let's say, let's say you're new to the gym, you go into the gym and you have a coach and they're teaching you how to squat. You can go in there and they can put on weight on the bar, but what do you want? Do you want to be able to lift that weight or do you want to be able, or do you want the coach to take more weight off the bar so that you feel subjectively stronger? You feel like you can do more and you feel stronger, but there's no weight on the bar. Like what people want is they want strength. Fundamentally is they want strength. 
And so, you know, and that I sort of tie that in because I think of strength very philosophically in terms of the ability to resist, broadly speaking, the, the ability to resist. But to tie it in with this, the ability to resist adversity, challenge, the ability to persevere and get through those things. And so, like, no one, no one goes to the gym to get – no one goes to the gym to remove weight. People go to the gym because they want to get stronger. They want to be able to uh, handle more adversity. But then when you throw things like the real world, uh, things that happen to us on the daily, because they're so uncomfortable and, and a lot of times, obviously, they're completely out of control, people sort of see – they feel like they're, you know – and in many ways, they lean towards comfort. And I, I feel myself doing that as well, you know, and and I don't think I do it as much as most people because I, I lean into discomfort quite a bit. But but I, I, do, I do feel sometimes that naturally we lean into comfort. And I think it's particularly easier in our Western world now in so many ways. Um, I, I don't know. What do, you th- what do you think? Like, I don't know. Do you agree with that? Do you think that people, generally speaking today, are more leaning into comfort? Uh, and do you think it's important to sort of – I know. I know you think it's important to sort of go against adversity, but uh, but I, I don't know. Maybe to some, maybe to someone particularly young who is who is out there, and and maybe they're they're in that stage now where maybe they're leaning into comfort a bit too much, and mm-hmm. like how like how do you get them back on track to say, or how do you even get them to understand and appreciate the value in 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 adversity, in challenge, in overcoming things? Yeah, I, I and I don't think that seeking comfort is a a modern phenomenon. I think that is just innately a part of, of uh, human nature, you know, and, and yeah. again, I, you could argue that to some degree seeking comfort is natural part of the, the concept and stoicism of, of oikiosis, which is, you know, self-preservation. So if, if, uh, if it's more comfortable to seek shelter in a cave in ancient times, I mean, really ancient times, prehistoric times, than to uh, sit out in the middle of a storm or out in the middle of you know the cold, that's self-preservation, right? So there's there's some degree toward which comfort is self-preservation, protecting protecting yeah. ourselves. The problem becomes when we seek comfort for comfort's sake, and so we have things nowadays like we call them comfort foods. You know, I'm going to go get a chocolate yeah. bar because it's a comfort food. It makes me feel better. Um, you know, that's where things go wrong and then the other the other you know area where arguably we're i think we're struggling in modern times is that our comforts uh, we we are no longer striking a balance between our comforts and the uh, the damage that we're doing to the environment as a whole to society and so forth you know everybody wants those comforts but we don't always i think consider the cost of the comfort you know what is the cost of modern day uh, comforts. And to some degree, I think it's time that we have to start to, uh, to evaluate some of those, you know, it's comfortable driving down the highway by myself in a big SUV because I, I feel safe. There's comfort in that. And there might be reasons why you need to do that. I think it's one of the things that Kai brings out Kai Whiting in his book, there might be a, a justifiable reason for doing that. But if it's just for your comfort, well, maybe the damage that you're doing to the environment in terms of emissions could be lessened by driving a slightly different car. Um, you know, it's not necessarily comfortable taking mass transit, but sometimes that might be the, the appropriate thing to do. So, right. um, yeah, we go, we go way, ast- I guess, way astray of the good if we get too caught up in, in comfort. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't yeah. mean also that we need to deny that. I mean, right. And, yes. and I've, and I've said repeatedly, the Stoics were not, they were not cynics. They were not, they, they were somewhat ascetic, but they were not, uh, annunciants in the sense that they, you know, abandon all of your property, abandon all your goods and, and live on the street as a pauper. That, that was the, those were the cynics. And there's a close relationship between the cynics and the Stoics. And, and you see in the discourses Epictetus holds the cynics in very high regard. In fact, he, call, he calls them you know, messengers of God. And he believes that it is a, a separate and distinct path that's even uh, and a more difficult path, but a faster path to virtue than the Stoic path. But as he says, it's, it's not for everybody. Right. Well, let's talk about that a little bit, because this is one of the things I really wanted to bounce off you. Uh, I've been thinking lately how 
stoicism is becoming more popular and i've been trying to really understand why that is and so i I sort of traced it back obviously you have socrates right it's sort of the grandfather of stoicism of all western philosophy really but particularly stoicism and then stoicism came about you have all obviously the, the stoics that we know about today sometime later christianity came about and there's tremendous overlap between stoicism and christianity um and one of the things i've been thinking about in terms of sort of where I guess the overlap with that is, is, you know, like if you take stoicism, and I know this isn't a perfect analogy, so bear with me, but just try try and bear with me abstractly here. If you take stoicism, which obviously assumes all externals are indifferent, right? Music is indifferent. Um, uh, even, even like relationships and communities are indifferent because they can be bad. They can develop your character positively or they can develop your character negatively. Mm-hmm. Now, in some sense, what I think Christianity did, and I, I, go, I, I know it's not perfect, but they sort of took Stoicism and then threw on music on top. It's like, okay, now we have church representing beauty. Now we have some music, and and here's a bunch of stories, and here's a community for you, and here's what you need to learn. Here's what you need to take from those stories. Here's what you need to learn from that music. So they give you they give you sort of this this package, this full package. Right, like I think Christianity, in many ways, it is a more um, complete package than Stoicism because I think in Stoicism, because it's it's it, in many ways, I feel like it's a skeleton, and you have to fill in the blanks in order to make it work with your individual life. Okay, now the beauty of that is that it's compatible, I think, for pretty much any walk of life. I, I really, I really believe that. And Christianity, maybe, I mean, I know it's not so because I know. I I take a lot of value in Christianity and learning from from it, but it's not for me. Um, But to get back to this stoicism as a foundation, what I feel like is really critical is people see stoicism and they look at things like music and, and, and relationships and community and beauty. And they say, well, like, how can you say that music isn't indifferent? Right. And so they sort of take a step back from it because they feel like because it's an indifferent means that, I, as a Stoic, cannot be a musician, right? And of of course that's wrong. You can, mm-hmm. I mean, I'm a musician. <laughs> I'm a musician, right? Um, but I, but nevertheless, I do think that there is that crucial misunderstanding when people come into it that because it's an indifferent means that they means that it cannot be means that they cannot value it particularly. Okay. So like, 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 what do you think about that? Because I feel like so many people come into it and they feel like they have to let go of things that they love. Like they, they might have a passion in music, for example. And I've said this before, if I had to choose between stoicism and music, stoicism would be gone <laughs> because music, I was just, I was brought up on music. Mm-hmm. Lucky, luckily stoicism doesn't ask you to make that, that, uh, that choice. It just has to be used in, a, in an appropriate way. But what do you say to someone who has a passion and wants to come into stoicism, but maybe are struggling with implementation i suppose in the stoic framework well i mean the the first thing is we have to understand what an indifferent means because an indifferent means simply that it has no bearing on your moral your moral character right Right. it's neither it's neither uh good or bad it could be used for good or bad and arguably music can be used for good and bad music can Mm be uh used to uh, to get you to feel uh, a, a a connection with other humans that you might not otherwise feel to aspire, you know, they uh, I've had a lot of people comment about the, the the music riff at the beginning of of Stoicism on Fire. A lot of people like that because it's very uplifting. Yeah. But music can also be very bass. I mean, you can. I mean, a lot of modern music is just it's it's borderline pornographic. You know, I mean, right. so. Music can go either way. So music in itself is just an indifferent. But again, even something that's an indifferent doesn't mean that it's indifferent to me, that I'm indifferent to it. My wife is an indifferent to me. My wife has no bearing on my moral character, but I don't treat her indifferently. Those are two different things. And and, uh, yeah, certainly there are some things that you could say, well, arguably that particular passion might be incompatible with the virtues. You know, we mm. could think of some of those things. My passion is to rob banks. Okay, that's yeah. not going to be compatible. You know, my 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 passion is to rule over people, to have power. Well, that's not compatible with virtue. 
Yeah, there's there's lots of things that we could say are passion, yeah. but there's a lot of things that we can say, yeah, it could be used for good or bad. Money is the prime example. Money isn't indifferent, but money can be used for, to, to do very good things. And it can also mm -hmm. be used to create great harm. Uh, political power can be used to do wonderful things to help other other humans. Political power can also be used destructively. Media, yeah. social media. Social media connects us in ways that we've never been connected before as human beings and can be very positive. Social media can also be very destructive and causes, causes some kids in schools to commit suicide because of the things that are said to them and about them on social media. So um, I, I think we get maybe hung up on, well, it's an indifferent. So there, the idea that something is an indifferent does not necessarily mean it's something that I have to reject out of my life, ignore, abandon, right. and has no value to me. That's, I guess that's the bottom line. Yeah, that's, that's a, you know, re really well said. And uh, I think it, I think if people understood that people would be more willing to sort of even consider stoicism as a philosophy, as a, as a way of life. Um, and I guess on those same lines, where I'm going with this is, we spoke last time about uh, sort of the the, uh, the house analogy where you have, you know, the, the, the house which philosophers build, let's say Seneca built built uh, to, to uh, explain stoicism in the modern, in his, in his modern day. And then you have underneath the foundations of stoicism, which you may say, uh, you know, the cardinal virtues, live according to nature, all that good stuff. And then you have the implicit ideas underneath. I don't know if you remember when we spoke about that personally, we, had, we, we spoke a bit about that, but I've been rethinking that a little bit because... As I, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I feel like Christianity has built upon Stoicism in many ways, um, and so I sort of think that what's happening now, and obviously there's still a lot of Christians out there, but certainly in my generation, it feels like people are slowly moving away to that and moving more towards Stoicism, and not just my generation, but lots of lots of people, and so maybe the analogy is more like you have maybe our psychology, which is the ground and, and the paleolithic and shamanistic religions. And then on top of that, the foundation is more like what the Stoics were talking about and what Socrates was talking about, you know, dialogue, rationality, reason. And then Christianity sort of built a house on top of that, which is, you know, like we talked about earlier, music, community, beauty, church, um, and so on. And so maybe what we're doing as a society in, in some ways is a lot of people are finding issue with the house. And so they're they're digging deeper into the foundations, which is actually the Socratic method and, and, and stoicism. Uh, I, I don't know. This is something I've just been thinking about. And I wanted to bounce it off you because I know you have a really deep understanding of, of, of stoicism. And I know I think you mentioned your daughter is a Christian as well. So presumably you have a bit of familiarity with that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. Like, what do you what do you make of that? Do you think that has something to do with maybe why people are more inclined to go towards stoicism in the modern day? Um, I guess right or wrong, I see it a, a, a little bit of a of a different uh, progression that brought us to where we are today. Hmm. And you know, briefly, I would say, if we were to roll back the clock, let's say you know three hundred years from from today, go back, you know, go back to the at least the 17th century. In the 17th century, the world was the, the Western world, and I'm gonna um, limit my comments to the Western world. The Western world was largely theistic. You would have been hard pressed to find someone who would walk up to you and say, yeah, I'm an atheist. It, they, that was very rare. And if you did say it, you were in many cases putting your, your, your career, your livelihood, maybe even your life at risk by making such a statement. So over the course of the next, you know, a uh, couple of centuries up until, you know, the, the end of the 19th century, we see a slow uh, secularization of the world. Charles, Charles Taylor in his book traces this very clearly in his book, The Secular Age, and how we, we went from a place where everyone believed in God to kind of a place where there's, there's a multitude of beliefs and where denying the existence of God is now normal. Well, at the end of the 19th century, so we have, we have uh, you know, Hume and we have Darwin and we have, uh, now, now here comes uh, you know, Nietzsche. And Nietzsche, who was very adamantly opposed to the Christians, but was also a very deep thinker with tremendous uh, insight into a deep psychology, you know, human psychology. And 
you know, when he, he saw what was coming, which was, okay, yeah, I want this Christian infrastructure to be torn down. But when we tear that down, something has to take its place. And Nietzsche knew that there wasn't anything in place. So that's why we see, you know, people talk about him and say, you know, God is dead, God is dead. And they think that is, you know, Nietzsche's uh, celebrating that God is dead. They need to go back and, and read the gay science, which is the book that that comes out of. And, you know, the, the madman is running through the village saying, God is dead, we've killed him. And the the villagers are mocking him. And he's saying, right. no, you know, who who are we to erase the, you know, the, the horizon and to, you know, to pull the moon down from the sky, if, I, if I'm quoting that correctly. But the point is, is that, we, now we move into the 20th century where, you know, uh, the idea of, uh, of God has, has basically been to a large degree erased over the course of the 20th century. Fewer and fewer people are uh, aligning themselves with any form of religious practice. To, I don't even know what the statistics are today, but it's a large number. So that brings us to the beginning of the 21st century when we have this sudden interest in stoicism and why would that come about here's what i believe i believe that we've reached a point in society where the the atheism the agnosticism and and its inherent nihilism has finally reached a breaking point for the average person and they realize my life is meaningless there's no point to this um this, there's got to be more. You know, everything that I've been taught tells me that this is all just a freak accident, that there's no real inherent meaning in life, that there is no God, and people are looking for something, anything. So in, in America in the 1960s, people were you know, uh, dabbling with, uh, with Hinduism and Buddhism and still are. But now you, you have Stoicism, and Stoicism is, is kind of unique in that there's this blend of rationality with a deep spirituality. So people yeah. pick up the Stoic texts and they start to read Marcus Aurelius meditations. And I know this from personal experience because I was a hardcore atheist <clears throat> in the 1990s, the first time I picked up the meditations. <clears throat> and I probably didn't make it to meditation three before I put it back on the bookshelf because I just couldn't get beyond all the God talk. It was clear to me that there's a deep sense of, of religiousness and, and spirituality in this. And I think that that's what what people are resonating with. Now we've got a conflict. These people who've been taught and raised as agnostics or atheists who've been, who went to college and had their professors, you know, mock religious belief. Um, and they've spent their, their entire adult life thinking that if you believe in anything, you're stupid and um, ignorant. And, you know, we, we all need to rely on scientific facts and rationality. And now they read Stoicism and there's something there that resonates with them, but they've got to get rid of that God stuff. So that's where you have modern Stoicism. I like all of this stuff, but I don't want God to go along with it. The thing that they fail to realize is the reason why you like it is because the God stuff is there. You just don't want to accept that. Because if you extract that, you end up with just rational philosophy. How many people really want to go back and, I mean, not that, that many people say, oh, I just want to go back and be an academic philosopher. I'm really interested in academic philosophy. I'm really interested in, you know, uh, and some people are interested in Platonism, but uh, not as a practice. They may, may go with, with Neoplatonism. So we end up with this <clears throat> really weird situation where in modern times, and I talk about it using the metaphor of, you know, World War One and the trench warfare, where if you're at all familiar with, with World War One, what happened is both sides ended up um, basically in a stalemate and you had deeply entrenched sides and in the middle you had no man's land and it was called no man's land because if you stepped foot out into no man's land you were going to get shot you're going to get killed so they very rarely they didn't want to cross no man's land and in this stalemate on the two sides the modern stalemate today is monotheistic religions on one side in the west largely abrahamic religions and on the other side we have uh, atheism and, and both of those can be very fundamentalist. And if you step out of either of those sides, if you step out uh, from Christianity and say, well, I want something a little bit more rational. If you step out from atheism and say, I want something a little bit more spiritual and you step into the no man's land in between, you're likely going to get shot by both sides. And therein lies the risk. And I think therein lies the, um, the challenge that we have as traditional Stoics, because we are, we are in a, um, 
a, a philosophical battle, largely, ironically, I don't end up in arguments on, in, on my um, Facebook page with Christians. Christians don't come in and say, you know, the stoic conception of God is wrong and you need to believe in Jesus Christ. And Christians don't do that. They come in and they, they see Stoicism and they see a lot that's similar to Christianity, but they don't feel the need to be too, uh, compelled to tell traditional Stoics they're wrong. <laughs> Atheists, on the other hand, I mean, it's, it's, it has <clears throat> lessened in the last year or so, but when I first opened that um, Facebook page in 2015, <clears throat> it was a melee. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> hmm. With the atheists coming in and telling us, you know, you're, you're stupid, it's religion, it's, it's faith. You know, the, one of the famous memes is stoicism is not a religion. You hear that everywhere. And there are yeah. a lot of implications of that. So here we are, again, traditional stoicism, I think, falls in this middle ground with some other very rational spiritualities that, um, that neither the atheists nor the theists really like. Right. And, 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 there, and there you have it. Yeah, that was very well said. Um, it, it's interesting to me, though, when people feel like they don't, they feel like belief in general is stupid. You know, it, there's two evolutionary biologists I follow, and they, they tell the story that they went to somewhere, I think in Africa, they were doing bio, bio, biology work, field work, and they were sitting down at the supper table, and it sort of came up that they didn't believe in God. It sort of just came up in conversation, and the people like up until this point, the people were really friendly sharing their food and it was like they were part of the family. And then all of a sudden it was like this dark cloud came over and everyone was very timid. And, you know, someone basically asked, well, if you don't believe in God, how do you stay moral? How, like, how do you be good if you don't believe in God? And in hearing this, this biologist talk quite a bit, I think what I've come to realize is that it's not that he didn't believe in anything. In fact, he says quite clearly, he, he's coming at this from a biological perspective. So he says, he put it beautifully to me. He said, long term, long, long, long term, there's no meaning to this because we know proton, protons are going to break down, electrons are going to break down, everything's going to fall apart, the, the universe is going to disintegrate. We know that. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that there's not a peripheral or, or an immediate meaning to life. And his meaning was that, and this, this is very much stoic in many ways, is that the immediate meaning to life is that is to create a world where as many people can enjoy the, the beautiful aspect and the privilege of life that we have as, as we have it right now. And so it's not that he didn't believe in anything because he believed in that. Because I think raw, if you don't believe in anything, you're a nihilist. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I think that's a very, very scary position to find yourself in. Um, anyone that's a, that's a real nihilist. I meet these people online every now and then, and they are just, and I, I, don't, I don't mean this in a judgmental way, but they're just very like unpleasant, let's say. They're mm -hmm. very unpleasant. They're very rude. They're very like they, they you can tell they just don't care. They don't care about other people. They don't care about presenting their ideas in a, in a respectful way. Um, and so it, so it's, it's interesting to me when people say, you know, if you believe in anything, you're stupid. It's like, mm -hmm. you better well, damn well believe in something. That do believe in something. They just don't even, they never even looked at their own assumptions. And again, mm -hmm. you know, this is when we look at the, the difference over time in 300 years ago, people who believed in God weren't challenged. They didn't have to defend their position. Yeah. I want to ask you today, if you go to college and go out into society as an agnostic or an atheist, who's going to challenge you? Mm. Nobody. You go through right. life unchallenged. Your belief system is completely unchallenged. In fact, you don't even realize you have a belief system, but they do. An atheist right. has a belief system. They just don't realize that they are holding on to a worldview that's based upon some assumptions, unprovable assumptions that facts, facts uh, that science cannot prove. I mean, the most, the most basic of them is, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here having a conversation over the internet with another person. That's what it appears to be. <clears throat> Can I prove that you're really there? Can I prove that there's anything beyond 
what's going on inside my brain? And the answer is no. You know, that's mm -hmm. Descartes' famous, you know, cogito ergo yeah. sum. I think, therefore, I am. But ultimately, that's the only thing I can prove is that I have thoughts going on in my head, therefore, I exist. Whether a real world out there exists or not, I can't prove. And that's just the, the, the beginning of the idea of, um, you know, Hume. Some people want to say, uh, in fact, one of the famous modern Stoics tries to argue that, you know, Hume is one of a, you know, a, 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 a double punch that defeated the concept of a, of a providential cosmos. Well, Hume also argued against the idea of predictability. He says you can drop a ball a million times and it's going to hit the ground. But before you drop the ball the million in one first time, you can't be certain it's going to hit the ground. Mm -hmm. The rules of the universe could change at any moment. We don't know. You can't prove it logically. You can't prove it scientifically. So people who are atheists build their... I mean, think about this. Um, an atheist, a true atheist, genuinely believes that... What, we, what do we have... Uh, you know, let's let's round it off to 15 billion years ago. A Big Bang occurred. Now, we have no con concept of what happened before the Big Bang or what caused the Big Bang or what the Big Bang is comprised of. You know, the, the famous physicist Lawrence Krauss calls it a universe from nothing, you know, which is a ridiculous concept. And when you, when you uh, read his book and when you watch his YouTube videos and you get him to describe what nothing is, what is nothing? Oh, well, nothing is this uh, bubbling, boiling field of quantum particles that pop in and out of existence and have the potential to create the known universe. Well, that's a completely, inter that's a very interesting concept of nothing, right? Well, where did this field come from? So anyway, I believe, you know, mm -hmm. just to, to believe, to say that you're an atheist and you believe that there's no rationality in the universe, you are in essence arguing that all of this occurred by chance, even our human consciousness. And, and you can't prove yeah. that. You can't even come close to proving that. And in fact, very brilliant scientists have, uh, have deduced that there is already, that there is not enough time from the Big Bang until now, there, there not enough time exists to have the combinations of amino acids to create even basic proteins, which is why you end up with things like um, concepts of, you know, you know uh, Francis Crick, you know, one of the the co, uh, I don't know the inventors, but co-discoverers of DNA. When confronted with this, that there's not enough time, well, guess what his answer was? Panspermia. Panspermia mm -hmm. is the idea that, you know, well, you know, the, the earth was bombarded by meteors that brought some of those particles. Right. Okay, well, all you did is you moved it back a step. So all these right. things were created someplace else. My, the point is, is that the people who say, well, yeah, I don't have any beliefs. I base everything on science. No, you don't. You just, you've been lied to and you were told that by your professors and by the books you've read, yeah. but you don't. And you, and, and unfortunately you live in a, in a society where those beliefs are never challenged. Yeah. Never challenged. A Christian, well, a, a religious person has their beliefs challenged every single day. Exactly. And I think it's, I know I mentioned to you personally, I think it's incredibly arrogant for anyone to criticize or call anyone stupid that they believe in a god or believe in something um i guess getting near the end here there's one thing i wanted to bring i wanted to get your take on and so there's this idea of universal reason in stoicism uh and god you know the pantheistic god is god is everything uh everything in the cosmos and so we we spoke about that quite a bit personally on how we all we all sort of share in in the universal reason we all have a piece of the universal reason within us and that that makes us uh to put it in a christian way that makes us divine right we all have a piece of piece of the divine within us um and i know and we spoke about that a bit earlier but after we spoke about that and i, I, I really what i want i'm interested in knowing is how beautiful that aspect of stoicism is that idea that we all sort of share in that divine cosmos and and not only share in it but well we share in it but there's a piece of it within us and then just just forgive me here i got to get up this quote because i it popped up after we spoke and do 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 if i can get it here so this is um neil degrasse tyson and i i stumbled upon this after we last spoke about universal reason so and i quote when i look up at the night sky and i know that yes we are part of this universe we are in this universe 
But perhaps more important than both of those facts is that the universe is in us. When I reflect on that fact, I look up. Many people feel small because they're small and the universe is big. But I feel big because my atoms came from those stars. And so that was just really beautiful to me. What do you think about that? Because I think that's such a beautiful aspect of Stoicism as a philosophy, the fact that we all share in that in that universal reason, in the cosmos, and that we all have a part to play. Yeah, and, and I think the only difference between me and uh, Niels deGrasse Tyson would be that not only did your atoms come from the stars, but the reason came from the stars or from that cosmos. And, that, and yeah. therein lies the fundamental difference. The... Uh, and people often ask me, well, what difference does it make really in my ethics? Why, why do I need to believe in providence or believe in God? What difference does it make? Well, one of the famous passages from, Mar uh, from Marcus Aurelius, Meditations 2.1, right? How does he open that? Remind yourself every day, and I'm going to, you know, paraphrase here. Remind yourself every day that you're going to come into contact with, you know, ungrateful, unbelieving, um, you know, nasty, awful people, right? But he didn't stop there. Right. That, but remember, they share in what? They share in the same divine mind as you. Yeah. Not in the same atoms as you. The same divine mind as you. They share a piece of that same divine mind, and that is what connects us and makes me realize that these ungrateful, horrible, terrible people are should not be viewed that way. They're just people who got it wrong. They don't know the difference between good and bad. They haven't been taught the difference between what is really good and really bad. But I have to remind myself as a practicing Stoic that I share a piece of the divine mind with them. And the idea of universal reason, I had, I did an interview on my podcast with a professor, uh, Tim Mulgan, who wrote a book, An Anthropocentric uh, Purposivism, A Purpose in the Universe, subtitles, An Anthropocentric Purposivism. He's a consequentialist um, ethicist, and he's a professor at, I think, University of Auckland. The whole point of the book is that without a purposeful cosmos, if the cosmos itself does not have a purpose, we have no grounding for, et for ethical behavior. We have nothing upon which to hang ethics. It's basically yeah. might makes right. It's you have your opinion. I have my opinion. Let's meet on the battlefield and duke it out or whoever has the most money gets to make the rules. But we end up in this, we end up in this place where the rules made by human beings become the the end the end all um you know the that that uh um i the you know, man is the measure of all things whereas and god i always forget her name the uh the famous um greek character uh, female who challenges her, her king the the father i'll think of it here in a minute but the, it's the story where the the uh, the king has uh condemned his own son uh, because he he spoke out against the king and and his, he's been he's been killed and his body is lying open and the birds are picking it apart and the daughter comes and wants to bury her brother and the king says no his body is to lie there and to be picked apart and eaten and in public public view <clears throat> she sneaks out and buries her brother and she gets caught in the act and she's hauled before the king and um, the the king says you've you've broken my law to which the daughter responds yes but there's a law above your law and when we don't have purpose in the cosmos we lose the law above our law and if it's nothing but man-made law now we can argue about what the law above that law is and that's what the stoics would say well it's nature and we need to observe how nature operates how animals operate how humans who are properly um raised and moral how they operate and then we know what those laws are because they're a part of us they they are a piece of us we are born with a even though the the stoics said that we we're born tabula rasa basically meaning we don't have any ideas in our heads we're still born with moral inclinations that if we are not damaged in our upbringing those moral inclinations will will automatically develop into moral behavior unfortunately we do get damaged, you know, most of the time in our upbringing. So the idea of hum of universal reason is that, and this is where, again, I, I would, where Niels deGrasse Tyson would vehemently disagree with me, is that reason exists before human reason. 
he would say, no, there's no reason in the cosmos. You know, the atoms, mm. he's basically saying, thank God all those atoms came down and accidentally, you know, combined in ways over long periods of time that produced me. He's not saying that there's any telos, any providence behind it, any purpose behind it, any order in it. And the Stoics, one of one of the great lines from, in fact, I used it in my, my blog cast on Universal Reason from uh, Pierre Hedo. And Pierre Hedo says that all of the Stoic doctrines, all of the Stoic dogmas come from the idea that human reason has to have a source, that it's not an accident, that it didn't happen by chance. And that source is universal reason. It is the, the concept of the divine that permeates the entire cosmos, every aspect of the cosmos, and, uh, and gives us a piece of itself so that we can understand the cosmos learn how to live with nature in agreement with nature so that we can lead virtuous lives and experience well-being. Beautifully put. Chris, thank you so much for joining me. I think we're going to end it there. It's a beautiful, beautiful spot to end. Um, thank you so much for agreeing to talk with me. I really appreciate you coming on and sharing your knowledge. I know you have a very, very deep, very deep guy, very knowledgeable, and I, I appreciate you taking the time. For well, thank sure. you for we having can, me. Uh, Oh, my, my absolute pleasure. Where can people find you? Where, I, where can people find your podcast, your website? The uh, podcast is Stoicism on Fire. It's on every podcast platform around the world. And uh, my, my blog is uh, traditionalstoicism.com. You'll also find the podcast there as well as some resources like a reading list. Um, you can also find me at the College of Stoic Philosophers, collegeofstoicphilosophers.org. I'll put all the links in the in the bio and thanks again so much. Until next time. Thank you. Wish you well. Take care.